My name is Benjamin Berger, and today I want to tell you the story behind the discovery of Stegosaurus and how over a century of excavations, reconstructions, and discovery has led to a much better understanding of this iconic dinosaur. It's hard to imagine a time before we knew about Stegosaurus. But the bones of Stegosaurus were not discovered until 1876, 35 years after Richard Owen coined the term dinosaur. And the first reconstructions of the iconic dinosaur were not known until 50 years after the first discovery. Surprisingly, when Stegosaurus was first found, it was not initially considered a dinosaur by O.C. Marsh. The the man behind the name Stegosaurus. Today, I want to explore how the idea of Stegosaurus evolved and how our perception of this classic dinosaur has changed over time with new specimens and new discoveries. The initial discovery of Stegosaurus is largely due to the diligence of Arthur Lakes, a paleontologist and geologist not as well known as he should be. Arthur grew up in England and was educated at the Queen's College in Oxford and traveled first to Canada, then on to the United States, where he found a job teaching in the Colorado Territory during the waning days of the gold rush. Arthur was a passionate rock collector and treated and collected mineral specimens that were discovered in many of the mines that were scattered across the Rocky Mountains. He was a passionate geologist, later writing and, and publishing textbooks, particularly about uh, coal and ore deposits in the American West. In 1873, the Episcopal Church, under the direction of Bishop George Randall, opened the first college of higher education in Colorado called Janus Hall on a barren, windy hillside outside the town of Golden, west of Denver. Shortly after the school opened, it became a secularized public institution, and today it is the campus of the Colorado School of Mines. Arthur Lakes was hired to teach a, a small number of students who enrolled at the school, bringing with him his interests in geology and paleontology. He was beloved by his students and spent much of his time collecting geological specimens and was also an accomplished artist painting in watercolors. In 1874, on a field trip with some students, they discovered a fossil dinosaur tooth, now known to belong to Tyrannosaurus from the late Cretaceous Denver Formation, not far from the school that he taught at. He showed this specimen to some other teachers at the college who recommended sending the specimen off to O.C. Marsh at Yale University. They never received any reply from Yale University, but by May of 1876, Arthur had amassed a sizable collection of other geological specimens, including large dinosaur bones and he exhibited his rock and fossil collection at the Great Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia, a celebration of the 100th anniversary of the United States of America. In its day, this event was like the greatest Disney World theme park ever, filled with the most cutting edge science. Thomas Edison was there, Alexander Graham Bell demonstrated his telephone to a mesmerized public. Imported bananas were sold for the first time with people eating them with knives and forks. And the first ever typewriter, um, complete with the QWERTY keyboard, the same arrangement that we use today on laptops and cell phones to send text messages. And there was Arthur Lake's rock and fossil collection. His rock and fossil collection was up against the world's greatest mineralogical specimens known at the time. You see, the exposition was organized by region and country, and each country or state exhibited their own exceptional collection of rocks, minerals, crystals, and fossils in their individual buildings or halls. 
Colorado was proposing statehood that year and had to share the building with Kansas. So inside the Kansas Colorado building was a model of the proposed state capitol building. And it was overflowing with the exhibit of Martha Maxwell, who had started a natural history museum called Mrs. Maxwell's Museum in Boulder, Colorado. She was a world-class taxidermist, inventing new techniques for natural poses of animals, showing off the wildlife of Colorado. Based on photographs, in front of Mrs. Maxwell's exhibit were some large dinosaur bones Arthur Lake had found along the Front Range, and included a few display cases of rocks and minerals of Colorado. The large fossil dinosaur bones on display attracted the interests of Edward Drinker Cope and O.C. Marsh, the two world-famous paleontologists from the East Coast who saw the fossils of dinosaurs on display and became intrigued. Both Cope and Marsh offered to purchase the fossil dinosaur bones from Arthur Lakes. But as a man of science, Arthur Lakes was more interested in their scientific description and eventual display in a public museum. O.C. Marsh proposed funding Arthur Lake's continued collection of dinosaur bones in Colorado, rather than purchasing the fossils. The less financially well-off Edward Cope had proposed just buying the fossils from him. Arthur was more inclined to work with Marsh since he was a professor at Yale University and director of the Peabody Museum, whereas Cope was not affiliated with the university and worked privately, although he did have an agreement with the National Academy of Sciences in Philadelphia. One particular specimen on display intrigued both paleontologists, a small fragmentary skull that preserved long, narrow teeth. And Arthur Lakes told the two paleontologists that more of the skeleton was likely still buried in the ground. O.C. Marsh convinced Arthur Lakes to send him the skull for a preliminary study and to return to the field for the rest of the skeleton. So by early June of 1876, Arthur was back in Colorado digging in a quarry and finding additional dinosaur bones for O.C. Marsh. The quarry was 20 feet across and 10 to 15 feet deep um, into the dipping beds of the late Jurassic Morrison Formation north of the town of Morrison, Colorado. Uh, working with a retired engineer with the Navy, Captain H.C. Beckworth, Arthur and Beckworth dug, revealing what he kind of described as several very large vertebrae, um, two nearly perfect long thigh bones, and some vertebrae that were attached to a flipper of an animal of the plesiosaurian kind. So this jumble of bones was then shipped to O.C. Marsh, still embedded in the hard matrix of sandstone. Back at the Yale Peabody Museum, O.C. Marsh began trying to figure out what this animal looked like, having a, a fragmentary skull previously loaned to him and a series of poorly preserved large bones. On November 15, 1877, O.C. Marsh gave a presentation on the fossils sent to him and published a short one paragraph or so description in the American Journal of Science in early December. Now, unbeknownst to him, the skull was from a completely different dinosaur, a diplodocus, sauropod, long-necked dinosaur. Hence, in Marsh's initial paper, he had the bones of two very different dinosaurs mixed up with each other. And nevertheless, he named the creature Stegosaurus armatus. The flipper bone that Arthur Lakes had uh, mentioned to him, extending from the vertebrae, well, Marsh recognized that bone as some type of osteoderm or portion of a hard shell uh, comparing the fossil to an ancient fossil sea turtle called Protostega. 
Marsh also alluded to an affinity to Plesiosaurus, the Loch Ness monster-like creature, and viewed the animal as a marine or aquatic swimming reptile rather than a dinosaur. While working on this short description of the fossil, Arthur Lakes and H.C. Beckworth were conducting a more ambitious collection of dinosaurs in 1877, and from April to June had collected additional fossil bones, sending them to O.C. Marsh to describe. Among this collection of dinosaur bones were giant dinosaurs, which uh, O.C. Marsh named Titanosaurus. He then had to re rename it Atlantosaurus since it was a preoccupied name by a dinosaur named Titanosaurus from, that was named by Richard Lidecker from India a few months earlier. And he also named Apatosaurus and Allosaurus in October of 1877. The newspapers reported on the discovery of these dinosaurs in Colorado and they neglected to mention either Arthur Lakes or H.C. Beckworth by name, which caused them some alarm at not receiving credit for all their hard work digging up these monstrously large bones, which required dynamite, chisels, and hammers. Hence, Marsh was kind of careful to mention their names at the conclusion of his short description of Stegosaurus on November 15, 1877. Edward Cope, Marsh's rival, would soon acquire a similar collection of dinosaurs from the Jurassic Morrison Formation as well, from the southern part of Colorado, near the town of Canyon City in 1877, and was to find the next Stegosaurus specimen. Dinosaur bones had been discovered near the town as early as 1869, but news of these discoveries was not published in the newspapers until January of 1877, when a local newspaper ran a story about dinosaurs being discovered by Henry Fetch, north of town. The news drew the curiosity of Ormel Lucas, a school teacher and superintendent of the public school system there. Now, Ormel was taking classes through a correspondence with Oberlin College in Ohio and wrote to one of his professors about finding some dinosaur bones near town. His professor suggested he contact Marsh or Cope and see if they would be interested in them and working with him to excavate more. In the early spring of 1877, Ormel Lucas wrote to both Marsh and Cope, and it was this time that Cope actually responded quickly, hiring Ormel and his brother Ira to start excavations that summer. The Lucas brothers began working the quarry that became known as Cope's Nipple, with excavations starting in 1877 and worked on until 1883. Although the area still produces dinosaur fossils, including three important stegosaurus specimens we'll talk about later. It was in this quarry, which was a softer mudstone, that the Lucas brothers found a second specimen of a stegosaurus-like creature, animal, that was named Hypsirhophius discarus by Cope in 1878. Now there's some debate whether Hypsirhophius discarus is valid, but the most recent paper in 2015 has argued that it's just a synonym of stegosaurus, and I think most people agree. Like Marsh's specimen, uh, Cope's stegosaurus was not very complete. The specimen included only a partial dorsal vertebrae, a rib fragment, some caudal neural arches and centrum, and like Marsh's specimen, bones of another dinosaur were mixed in with it, a, a theropod femur. However, in describing the specimen, Cope recognized the fossils as belonging to a dinosaur. So despite two species named, paleontologists really had no clue what stegosaurus looked like. And there was no illustrations yet of the dinosaur published or, or even attempted. That was about to change, but the discovery would come in a mysterious letter sent to O.C. Marsh by the notorious Harlow 
and Edwards. We'll soon find out who Harlow and Edwards were, but let me first read you uh, their letter that they sent. It reads a bit like a ransom note. Union Pacific Railroad Company, Agent's Office, Laramie Station, Wyoming, July 19th, 1877. Uh, dear sir, I write to announce to you the discovery, not far from this place, of a large number of fossils, supposed to be those of Megatherium. Although there is no one here sufficient of a geologist to state for certainty. We've excavated one partly and know where there are several others that we have not as yet done any work upon. The formation in which they are found is that of the tertiary period and we are desirous of disposing of what fossils we have and also the secret of the others. We are working men and we are not able to present them as a gift and if we can sell the secret of the fossil bed and procure work in excavating others, we would like to do so. We have said nothing to anyone else. We measure one shoulder blade and found it to measure four feet, eight inches in length. One joint of the vertebrae measures two and a half feet in circumference and 10 inches in length. As proof of our sincerity and truth, we will send you a few fossils at what they cost us in time and money in unearthing. We'd be very pleased to hear from you as you're a well-known enthusiastic geologist and a man of means, both of which we are desirous of finding, more especially the latter. <laughs> Hoping to hear from you very soon before the snows of winter set in, we remain very respectively your obedient servants, Harlow and Edwards. So Harlow and Edwards were the alias of two railroad workers who had found large fossilized bones near Medicine Bow, Wyoming, near the rail station that they worked at. They had fallen on hard times and hoped that they could get O.C. Marsh to pay for their extraction and sell the bones to him for a large sum of money. Marsh replied to the letter asking them to send the bones to him in Connecticut, which they did. But it took until mid-October of 1877 until the package arrived at the museum, which relayed the message that there were more bones if he was interested. Marsh sent a check to Harlow and Edwards for $75, about $2,000 in today's money. Sadly, when it arrived, they could not cash the check since Harlow and Edwards were the alias of William Harlan, the station agent, and William Reed, the section foreman on the railway line. Marsh wired Samuel Wilston, a man who had been working on the Morrison excavations with Arthur Lakes, to head up to Wyoming immediately. Samuel Wilston took the train and met up with Harlow and Edwards on a chilly November 14th day. Harlow and Edwards sheepishly explained that they had used made-up names, the made-up names of Harlow and Edwards, and they took Samuel Wilston to the site of their bone discovery, a ridge called Como Bluff that lay just a few miles from the railway tracks. It was filled with thousands of dinosaur bones. The site was amazing since it was about one mile from the rail line and the two men had spent the summer excavating the site, a place that would be called Quarry One and had hundreds of bones ready to ship out. Samuel Wilston sent a letter to Marsh who drew up a contract with the two men that he would purchase the fossils and pay them a salary as long as he could have an experienced paleontologist oversee the excavations. The two men agreed as the cold, bitter Wyoming winter set in. Excavations started immediately through the winter of 1877 and 1878, and the team dug, lifted, they boxed and they carried by hand the numerous giant and very heavy dinosaur bones down to the rail station during the bitter cold of a Wyoming winter. The team at first worked well together, but the grueling work soon dispirited them. The first man to abandon the group was William Harland, the station agent, who leaked to the newspapers the discovery and exaggerated how much they were getting paid in the hopes of attracting the interest of Edward Cope to hire him at a higher salary. Whether the leak worked as planned or not, Carlin started collecting for Edward Cope in the summer of 1878, 
and refused to let William Reed ship the bones from the station house. Hence, by the summer of 1878, fossils were flowing to both Marsh and Cope, although the vast majority ended up in Marsh's collection. By the next winter of 1878 and 1879, William Reed was working alone or with a small group collecting for O.C. Marsh, while William Harland was collecting for Edward Cope, only a few yards away. By this time, Reed had opened five numbered quarries, including Quarry 4 on the far end of the ridge. When summer arrived in 1879, both Edward Cope and O.C. Marsh visited the quarries at Como Bluff. William Harland sent Cope one of the few dinosaurs that he had excavated that year, and Cope hastily wrote about the specimen that he named Hip Sir Hophius, Seely Anis, 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 uh, named for the English dinosaur paleontologist Harry Seely and Anis, which I don't think Cope meant anything by because he called Harry Seely a friend in the paper. <laughs> in any case, the specimen was lost, which might be a good thing since he described the teeth resembling the meat-eating dinosaur Megalosaurus, indicating that this species was obviously a jumble of various other dinosaur bones like Allosaurus, and did not make any note of the diagnostic plates that characterize Stegosaurus today. In the summer of 1879, O.C. Marsh himself and Arthur Lakes visited the ridge, with O.C. Marsh discovering Quarry 7, and later Arthur Lakes finding the first mammal jaw from Quarry 9. A few of these bone quarries produced a few stegosaurus bones, such as quarry 4. But none was as rich in stegosaurus bones as quarry 11, quarry 12, and quarry 13, discovered during the summer and late fall of 1879. These bones included most of the skeleton of stegosaurus, but from seven different individuals scattered across three widely spaced quarries. The bones were all disarticulated, and they were boxed up for preparation back at the Yale Peabody Museum in New Haven, Connecticut, where O.C. Marsh and his team were tasked at reconstructing these bones into the creature we know today as Stegosaurus. From 1879 until 1896, O.C. Marsh was tasked with reconstructing the anatomy of Stegosaurus from these seven jumbled collections of bones. O.C. Marsh published seven papers on Stegosaurus up to his death in 1899. In December of 1879, O.C. Marsh published his first paper on Stegosaurus from Como Bluff, Wyoming, where he named the species Stegosaurus ungulatus and described the huge plates that protected the animal, but featured no illustrations of the bones. In March of 1880, Marsh published the first ever illustrations of the fossil plates and tail spikes of Stegosaurus, but was still very much confused about the skull, which you remember the initial specimen he named Stegosaurus include the skull of Diplodocus, a very different type of animal, a long neck sauropod. Hence, his description includes that of a skull of Diplodocus with its pencil-like teeth and small brain that was collected from Quarry 8 and completely misidentified as belonging to Stegosaurus. In February of 1881, Marsh published an infamously incorrect description of Stegosaurus in describing the spinal cord. Now remember that he had the skull of Diplodocus, but matched it with the sacrum of Stegosaurus and was amazed to see there was this large cavity in the opening for the spinal cord within the sacrum. It was much larger than the brain cavity seen in the misidentified skull. Hence, Marsh inferred that Stegosaurus had a larger hind brain and mistakenly believed Stegosaurus of having two functional brains, with the hind brain being the dominant one since it was much bigger. The paper also featured the first illustration of the articulated forelimb and hindlimb, which were proportionally very different, suggesting to Marsh that Stegosaurus was bipedal, walking only on its hind legs. These would all prove false. 
but inspired the 1884 reconstruction by A. Tobin of a bipedal armored dinosaur. In 1883, Cope was running low on funds, while O.C. Marsh began to get government contract work with the United States Geological Survey to fund his research on dinosaurs. He convinced the United States government to fund the publication of a massive volume on dinosaurs and to continue the collection of new specimens in the American West, with specimens going to the Smithsonian Museum in Washington, D.C. Marsh hired Marshall P. Fetch, whose brother had reported on the first dinosaur bones in Canyon City, Colorado, with Cope unable to support the quarry work there by the Lucas brothers. Marsh took over collections from the area in 1884, a quarry that would be called the Fetch Quarry No. 1, and in the center of this jumbleized, fossilized group of dinosaur bones was the most complete stegosaurus specimen to be collected, including the first correctly attributed skull of stegosaurus. In 1887, Marsh figured the correct skull of Stegosaurus from Canyon City Quarry, uh, correcting the mistake he had made before, although he introduced the idea of identifying the various species he had named by different numbers of tail spikes, between eight and two uh, spikes reported from different species that he had named. We now know that all species of Stegosaurus only have four tail spikes. For the next 10 years, Marsh worked on a detailed illustration of all the dinosaur bones that he had acquired for the Peabody Museum, and using government funds to publish a beautiful, lavishly illustrated uh, drawings of the dinosaur bones in his collection. In 1897, just two years before his death, the giant huge volume was published as a USGS monograph to the United States Congress. In plate 52 in this great monographic volume on dinosaurs was the first reconstruction of Stegosaurus, with the plates along the back in a single row, and eight rather than four tail spikes. This reconstruction would be instrumental in shaping our understanding of stegosaurus and dinosaurs for the coming century. The illustrator Charles Knight used Marsh's 1897 reconstruction for his early life reconstruction of stegosaurus, the first ever painting a stegosaurus complete with eight spikes on the tail, and interestingly enough, paired plates. This illustration was used to create a life reconstruction for the Smithsonian Museum. The task of mounting a skeleton of Stegosaurus fell to Richard Lowell, the paleontologist hired after the death of O.C. Marsh by Yale University, and a controversial scientist for his ortho unorthodox views of evolution. O.C. Marsh had left the blueprint for how the bones went together with his illustrations, and Richard Lowell headed up the team to put the bones together for display at the museum, a task that took them 12 years. Richard Lowell described Stegosaurus as the most grotesque reptile the world ever saw, and in 1910 published a paper describing the plates as paired along the back of Stegosaurus rather than a single file of plates, similar to the idea Charles Knight had in his painting. Two proprietors at the Peabody Museum, Hugh Gibb and W.S. Benton, mounted the heavy fossilized bone using the various partial sets of bones from Como Bluff, Wyoming, since the more complete stegosaurus specimen from Colorado went to the Smithsonian. Having acquired the more complete stegosaurus specimen from Colorado, the Smithsonian mounted its own skeleton, noting that Stegosaurus had only four tail spikes and that the plates alternated in a paired fashion along the back. In 1914, this version of Stegosaurus, with its lifelike reconstruction, went on display and still remains, a hundred years later, one of the most accurate depictions of Stegosaurus. The Yale Peabody Stegosaurus underwent revision in 1924 and again in 2010 when the Paleontology Hall was refurbished. 
Additional fossils of Stegosaurus would be found with two additional, very complete skeletons from Canyon City, discovered by a high school teacher named Frederick Kessler in 1937, and excavated by local high school students, and a remarkable specimen discovered by Brian Small for the Denver Museum in 1992. Many additional specimens were found in Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, leading to the knowledge that Stegosaurus was a widespread genus in the late Jurassic of the western part of North America. Today, hundreds of specimens are known of Stegosaurus, including juvenile specimens. And while there's still some debate as to the pose and function of the plates along the back and in differences between the various skeletons, the early pose of the 1914 mount of Stegosaurus still remains the standard view of Stegosaurus today. I want to thank Brian Clever, Pablo Lozato Figuez, Arcotis 1811, Justin Bovey, Emmett Larson, and Marlo Andrecchio, and Fred Olney. Um, thank you, everyone, for your support on Patreon. If you'd like to learn more about supporting these educational uh, videos on paleontology and geology, check out the link in the description below. Thanks for watching.